We're back, and we're here with Maria Schneider, whose latest book, Storm Glass from Mira, is in bookstores now. Maria, welcome back to the show. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm great. Two great years, to two more books. Yes. Very consistent. <laughs> I try to be. <laughs> now, we talked about the fact that Fire Study was coming out two years ago when you were here, and it was a rip roar of a finish to a. Uh, to the tale of the journey of Yelena and her her other half, Varric. Yes. At the end. Mm -hmm. uh, and in Fire Study, there was a character, a central character, quite honestly, in the resolution of the storyline, mm -hmm. who you have now turned into the focal point of your next series of books set in this world you've created. Right. And her name is Opal. Yes. And she is a student at the uh, at Magician's Keep, has been, and it's five years after the conclusion of the events in Fire Study. Mm -hmm. uh, an interesting character, uh, certainly a different kind of personality. For someone who has, who played such a central part in that last story, this is a young lady with absolutely no self confidence. Yes. Yes, she is that. Uh, it was hard, you know, switching from Yelena, who was very, very strong confidence, very um, persistent, can-do type of person, to go to another character and get in her head. I sort of had to exercise Yelena from my mind and get into Opal's character. And she's had a lot happen to her during the course of the last, you know, the last five years hasn't been that eventful, but when the events in Fire Study and even in magic study, she had a, a bit part in magic study that um, she's still carrying around with her a, a measure of guilt and, and not a lot of confidence from that. Well, that's, the, that's true. And, and, yet, and yet, it is the actions that she uh, performed in fire study that caused her to be sent to the magician's keep in the first place because she helped Yelena b uh, by creating vessels in which to store the essence, souls, how do you want to? Well, yes, the souls from, from fire study, the, the, um, the evil souls, they, they, they couldn't even trust them in the fire world because they were afraid that they would communicate with current like magicians and try to escape. So they imprisoned them in these glass, yeah, glass prisons is what I was referring to them. And you've hidden them in secret, inaccessible places all over your world. Right, now. right. So let's talk a little bit about Opal. Now, Opal is a glassmaker. Right. She, she fashions and creates items out of glass. She comes from a family of glassmakers, a prominent family of glassmakers, mm -hmm. and is quite accomplished in her craft. What is her insecurity? Well, it's more for her magic, not so much for the glass. I mean, she's very confident when it comes to glass and, and creating things with the glass. It's just her magical skills. She thinks she's a one-trick wonder, that she has one trick that she can do, and that's it. She traps, she can trap magic inside glass. And only magicians can see that magic. It's like an inner glow to like a glass statue. And magicians can use that glass to communicate with other magicians far away. They're sort of like little magical cell phones is how I, I look at it. And that's all she can do. You know, she can produce these messengers, but other people can use it, but she can't even use her own device. Now, we should say she can produce these, she's, mm -hmm. and she can, can distribute them, but they are only useful for a period of time. The magic she infuses them with is kind of like a charged battery. Right, right. Eventually, the magic gets used up, and they're no longer useful, and she has to make more. So they don't, you know, they're not everlasting so there's a, a bit of a limit to them so she's kind of like the apple iphone of her <laughs> world and, you know you get it from them or you don't get it from anyone right right and and you think she would be like oh i'm so special but you know, she's had a lot of history and things and she's still pretty young i mean she's about 19 20 at the start of storm glass and you know she just doesn't have any kind of real feeling that 
she is that important. Well, she, she also feels that she failed in something absolutely huge in terms of the death of her sister, which right. happened, which occurred in the earlier books, and she's still carrying that around a lot in right. terms of her self-image. Right, and that's part of the guilt, too, plus what she did to Yelena, too, which I won't say, but it's a bit of a trick in magic study. But they're um, friends now. It's they're all right. friends because, yes, because Yelena could see that she had been forced to do it. Yes. And that she, it was of no fault of her own. I mean, at that time, she was like 14 and, and, and very vulnerable at that age. And I think what happens there is what carries through so that even at 19, she still has it with her and she has to work her way through it, which Stormglass gets her started in the right direction. Now, what, why did you focus, because so much of this book, talks about and, and quite honestly expresses a love of the act of making and creating glass work. Mm -hmm. Now is that a, that, that, that's something that's personal to you too. You enjoy that. You have experience in it, correct? Yes, I took some classes on how to blow glass and work with glass and I really enjoyed them. And you know that's something that Opal is confident in. And so in order for the readers to connect a little bit and not think that she's just this whiny brat and, and give up on her, uh, I needed she her her glass ability is is very um, part of her, and she uses it as a metaphor. Uh, a lot of times, you know, when she's when she feels fear or something, she's like like oh my my heart just melted like you know that sand would melt in a cauldron. I mean, it's it's very linked to her, and she's very artistic in how she looks at things. Now, in this book, her experience as a glassmaker, her knowledge of of the techniques of glassmaking, her family's experience, the connection she has with other glassmakers is a central element in driving the plot along mm -hmm. and also and carrying her into a whole other series of adventures. You are very, very cruel to your heroines. Oh. <laughs> well, you gotta keep them in trouble in hot water, <laughs> otherwise it would be boring for the reader. I'm t I've, I've gotten emails at like three in the morning where people yell at me because they could not put the book down because they just had to happen. <laughs> See, I'm cruel to them too, my readers. <laughs> because, you know, bad things have to happen to her and I'm not going to protect her. She's got to learn to protect herself. Right. And, and, and in, in this adventure, as she's sent out from the, uh, the Magician's Keep to, on, on a specific mission, is to help another set of magic users, a very specific set of magic users. And I find this interesting because all of a sudden you get into the practical economic applications of various forms of magic. We're starting to develop that aspect yes. of the world that we haven't examined quite as specifically. And let's talk about the storm dancers and the role that they play. What is a storm dancer? Okay, a storm dancer is a magician and their role in the society is when a big storm is coming onto the coast, or like a hurricane, uh, they go out onto the coast and they, they harvest the energy out of those storms. They pull all the energy out so when it does finally reach land and get to land, it ends up being like a rainstorm and not like this horrible killing like, like Katrina. If, if, if Katrina was coming, we'd send the storm dancers out and then until it reached New Orleans, it would have been just like a, a rain event. Right. And they use the energy that they have drained out of the storm and they store it yes. in glass orbs. Yes, they have these yeah, glass orbs and that's where they store the energy. For some reason, only glass will work, not metal or plastic. Well, they don't have plastic, but uh, only glass will work and they stopper it and then they use that energy in their factories to help fuel their factories. And, and at this point, it's kind of become like the oil for that particular region in right. terms of it is the primary source of energy to drive industry right. for the yes. tribe. Especially, yes, for the Storm Dance clan. They, they use it for all their factories and in their manufacturing. And some of the other clans are not happy about that. They want them to share. So that adds another layer of conflict to the plot, too. So I really start getting into the more, you know, the politics of it. And, you, and, and talking about politics, you get more into the politics of the countryside the place of the magicians within that political weave between right. the clans. You have a, one clan that is very unhappy with its current leadership. That drives a portion of the plot. Right. You have uh, people within clans who do not have the gift that would make them prominent members of the clan, and that drives their actions in the story. It really, quite honestly, I find it a more complicated and textured landscape to walk on 
with this story. It, I really delighted in that. I really oh. found it fascinating. That's great. I'm glad you did. Yeah, it's um, certainly I'm exploring the world more. I mean, I had the three books, the study books that were all set in the world, but it was from Yelena's point of view. And so she spent time in Ixia and in Satia, and then in, she was bridging the gap between the two different uh, societies there. But now this is more all within the Satian, you know, the 11 clans and the council, and, you know, and how they deal with things, and especially with these new glass messengers, because it's a technological leap to go from, you know, sending a message and taking 10 days to get there to, you know, picking up your glass messenger and taking 10 seconds. And, and, and we should say that Ixia, we actually find out a little more about Ixia and the politics of Ixia that we may not have discovered. And we also find out that perhaps where before any form of magic was evil, mm -hmm. there are shades of what is acceptable depending on its usefulness and whether it's mm -hmm. directly involving a magician performing the magic. There, right. there, there are some people who are not quite as rigid as the commander, perhaps. Right. The commander is pretty much no magic because he fears it and doesn't want it in his, his, his you know, area, you know, where he's at. But he's starting to see that it's not quite so black and white, that if he could, if the storm, storm dancers could come up to the, the northern ice sheet where they have these horrible blizzards, they could come up to the blizzards and tame them, and then, you, you know, the, you get the energy from it, so that increases the amount of bottled orbs that they're getting. It's like striking oil. And also, it's like opening new lands because all of a sudden it's a more livable environment because right. the storms have been tamed. Right, and you don't have to worry about losing your whole, you know, your whole factory because of a really bad blizzard. Now, we shouldn't say this is all about politics and grand geopolitical schemes and everything like this. It's very much focused on Opal uh, and, and a certain storm dancer that she meets. who, <laughs> And they both share a unique tragedy in having lost siblings they were close to. That's right. They, they, both, they both lost a sister that was pretty close in age to them, uh, I believe, like within a year. And, you know, siblings that are close in age tend to be close, yes. you know, closer. And um, it was interesting because the book, I also have Yelena's brother, Leif, come in and help out. And he talks about his famous sister. And the other glassmaker has, also has a famous sister who's a glass artist. And it's like lots of sisters in the book. So I dedicated the book to my own sister. I only have a, one sister, my sister Karen. And I dedicated the book to her. And I said it had a sister vibe. <laughs> and she read the book. She was thrilled. She read the book. And she goes, are you sure about that? She goes, you sure this isn't something from your subconscious? Because a lot of these sisters are dead. She goes, yeah, it has a dead <laughs> sister vibe. Are you trying to tell me something? <laughs> Well, and I'm like, hmm, no, I don't think so. But, but, but a lot of it is driven by the fact that a lot of these characters see themselves as not having measured up to the expectations of their families. And their many families, of yes. them. And, that, and it's, it's driving a lot of your plot line along. Yes, and it is, because I know growing up with my older sister, you know, she did everything first. And all the teachers, we had, you know, similar teachers, and I kept hearing about how how, oh, but your sister just loved math and got all A's, but yet, you know, I didn't. And they would, they would compare me to my sister all the time. So um, I think that has something to do with the books and, and, and the characters feeling that they're not living up. Now, last time we talked, we had talked about the fact that your first novel, Poison Study, took mm -hmm. you five years to create. Yes. And how each subsequent book, you had two struggles. One, keep it new, mm -hmm. keep it fresh. Mm -hmm. And two, don't take five years. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the publishers don't like it when you take five years. <laughs> and when you were here, we talked about Magic Study would have been just come out and Fire Study was coming. Mm -hmm. And it had taken you, you had gotten from five years to nine months in yeah. terms of a writing cycle. Have you been able to maintain that? Uh, sort of. I, um, I have about the same amount of time to write, but now with promotion and emails from readers and mm -hmm. other things. You have, I, a, you have a wonderful website. Oh, thank you. And I try and keep that you know, current and up to date, and I email every reader back who emails me because I think it's really important. And so, actually, I have the same amount of time to write, but then I find myself, like the last couple months, just going, oh, no, i got to get this done, and then spending, it's sort of like a cram session. So I'm writing the books faster, but um, it's more stressful. Has, has 
taking a look at another part of the world and another part of the mechanism of the world made it easier for you to keep things fresh and yes and, and not and not as you say repeat yourself right yes that's one of the reasons we I changed to a new character for Stormglass I mean a lot of my readers email that they wish they'd I'd have another story about Yelena but you know at the end of fire study I was pretty happy with where she ended up and I really didn't have any new ideas for her but yet, Opal was exciting, somebody new, somebody mm -hmm. different, and I could explore different worlds, like the Storm Dancers, and we can go to Ixia with the blizzards and things like that, and, you know, use my weather background for and we it. Still, and we still get to meet some of our characters from the yes. previous novels. Yes, they're still there. I mean, if they were needed for the story, I used them. I didn't just put them in because pe people or readers like them. Yes. It's one of the reasons Valak didn't come. Everybody loves him, but... There was no reason to put him there, and I didn't want to just stick him in just because. Now, you have Stormglass out. Yes. And you, you had Fire Study done when you had Magic Study out. Right. Stormglass is out. Where are we with the following story? Because you've kind of put your character on a pre precipice here. I'm not talking about, you know, dangling by her thumbs on a wall somewhere in a dungeon. I'm talking about she has discovered things about herself that could, in this society, place her in serious jeopardy mm -hmm. just because of what she can do mm -hmm. and the capabilities she discovers. So we're all hanging on tender hooks here. When are we going to get our next hit? <laughs> Not another year, please. No, no. Actually, the Sea Glass is coming out in September. So Sea Glass is the follow-on story. Is, is, yes, that's the follow-up story, and that will be coming out in September. So it's um, only four months after Storm Glass, which is pretty good for my readers. They usually have to wait a year. Uh, so that's coming out. And then the third, there will be a third glass book, because I already started with that. And that either will be a year or six months after Sea Glass, depending on how much I get written this summer. <laughs> <laughs> and how many people email you telling you how much they like Stormglass. Yes, yes. And, and asking you to hurry up and publish yes. the next book. Yes, yeah, they, they encourage me to write faster. And then you write them back and you're writing slower. Yeah. It's this horrible <laughs> negative entropy loop going yes, on. Yes, I need to set aside some time that's just is to return emails and this is my writing time. And you will make everyone incredibly happy if you do. Maria, we're just about out of time. Okay. And I want to thank you for coming back and talking to us. I want to thank you for Stormglass. Oh. It's a delightful read. I can't wait to find out what happens to this young lady. Oh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I did very much. And thank you again for coming. And please come again. Oh, I'd love to. Thank you. Terrific. Well, that's it for this edition of Fast Forward. We hope you found something of interest. We hope you come see us again. Until then, this is Tom Schott saying, take care.